Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman at an employment agency. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the full test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Hi there. Welcome to People Central. I'm Sarah. How can I help you? Hi Sarah. I'm Mark. I'm out of work right now and I'd like to find a job. I'm sure we can find something for you. We have lots of companies searching for people in different industries. What kind of job are you looking for? I'm looking for a job in accountancy. Fine. I'm sure we can help you out with that. To begin with, I need to take some personal details for our files. You said your first name is Mark. What's your surname? It's Castle. C-A-S-T-L-E. Thank you. And I need your address. It's 13 Wellington Street, South Brisbane, Queensland. And the postcode? It's 4101. Now I need your date of birth. It's 30th of May, 1988. Thank you. Let me just write that down. What was the month again? May, the 30th of May, 1988. Got it. Do you have an email address we can have? Yes. Let me think for a second which is best. Do you have more than one? Yes, I've got three. Really? Okay, I think I know. The address you can use is markc at australianow.com. Okay, just a minute. I have to write that all down. Did you say the provider is australianow.com? That's right. Good. Now, what contact phone numbers do you want to give me? My home number is 07 3554 7671. Do you have a mobile phone number as well? As that's often the easiest way to get hold of people. Of course. My mobile number is 046 Nine one five three double four three. Thanks. Now let me look at the form. Yes, there's just one more initial question left, and that is whether you have any preferred areas where you'd like to work. I don't really want to travel too far from home, so the area of Brisbane, of course, and I suppose anywhere within a drive of about two hours. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, do you have your professional certificates? Yes, here you are. They're all in this file. I'll need to make some copies, but our copier is down. Do you mind if I keep them for a day? I have scans of all of them. I can send them to you in a moment from my phone. You can just check the originals now. That's a good idea. I'll do that in a second. Now, we've got a selection of different companies looking for an accountant right now. Let's have a look at this first one. It's a big printing company down that coast called Gold Coast Printing. It's about an hour away and you can drive there quite easily. I know that company. I can also get a train there quite easily, which I prefer, as it takes away the stress of the drive. I hate driving too far and buses are always too slow for me. Well, that's handy then. So Gold Coast Printing needs someone full time starting as soon as possible. The working hours are nine to five, Monday to Friday. For details about what exactly you'd be doing and the benefits package, you'll need to talk with the company itself. We just get you together. It's certainly a possibility. I have another company here that needs a part-time accountant starting next month. They're an import-export company and they have a Brisbane City Centre location. Parking might be a problem, but the bus or tram would get you there easily. Yes, the travel is no headache and it'd be fun to work in the City Centre, but I'm not sure about a part-time job. I'll probably need to earn more than that can provide. Yes, that might be a problem. Let's look at the next one then. It's a fishing company called Barracuda, down on the docks at the Brisbane River. They're a small family firm and they need a full-time accountant to help them with their expansion. 
That would be very interesting, but I usually prefer larger companies. When it's a small company, there can often be problems with personal relationships. Well, that's the three possibilities that we have right now, though I know we might be getting some more next week. Well, I was quite interested in Gold Coast Printing. I can get in contact with them and then see what comes in next week. Okay, I'll set up a meeting for you with them. By the way, do I need to pay you anything for placing me? The company who we place you with will pay us, but you aren't charged any commission at all. Oh good, that's great for me. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two, you will hear a woman giving an introductory talk at a health center open day. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully to the information talk and answer questions 11 to 17. Welcome everyone today to the Sway Road Health Centre's open morning. My name is Lucy and I'm a nurse based at the health centre. I'd first like to tell you a little about the health centre. We have six doctors who work here full time and we are part of the district's medical services to those who live within our practice area. Currently, we have just in excess of 7,000 patients registered here. The patients are served from our centre here in Sway Road, but we also have a secondary centre in Church Road to ease congestion here and to make it easier for patients who live in that part of town. To register with us, please come during opening hours, bringing a photo ID, a proof of residence address dated within three months of your application and your medical card, if you have one. If you don't, we'll ask you to fill out a registration form. We will ask for your preference for your doctor and we will try to comply, although this is not always possible. When applying, the reception staff will ask you for your medical history and they will also ask a nurse to take a blood sample. It's unusual that we would turn anyone down and you can see a doctor as soon as you've registered. Your updated medical card will be posted to you as soon as possible. If you want to make an appointment with us, this should be made by telephone and not by email. We have email, but due to the large amount we received, some do not get read fast enough and appointments are not made in time. Calls can be made to our centre during our opening hours, which are 8am to 1pm and 2pm to 7pm, Monday to Friday. Between 1 and 2pm, the centre is closed, except for emergency calls only. We are closed on Saturdays, Sundays, and on public holidays. If you do have an emergency, we would stress that a serious one would be better served by going to hospital or by calling an ambulance. Our practice supports the training of medical students and you might be asked whether your visit to a nurse or doctor can be done with a student present. There is no obligation for you to accept this and the student will not be present if you prefer to have your consultation in private. Our surgery offers a complete travel service, including a full range of vaccinations. The wide diversity of destinations and the increased popularity of adventure holidays increase the risk to your health, which in turn makes the service we provide increasingly complex. Ask for a travel risk form at reception or download it from our website and hand it in to our reception as soon as you've booked your holiday. Our nurse will review the form and advise you on the vaccinations you should have. It's also a good idea to keep a vaccination card, so you have a record of what you have had over the years. Vaccinations must be paid for on the day of administration, unless you are covered by a health insurer. 
You now have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the introductory talk and answer questions 18 to 20. Finally, if you have any suggestions to improve our service, please use the suggestion box at reception. We will provide you with paper and pen if you don't have any. Also, from time to time, people feel that they have a problem with their care. If you have any complaints about the service you receive at our health centre, please bring this to the attention of the practice manager who will be happy to discuss the issue. We have a complaints procedure that is available at reception or it can be downloaded from our website. So, today, all our staff are here for this Saturday morning so that you can look around the centre and ask any questions. This includes all our doctors, nurses and support staff. All the areas are open, except for the practice offices, which have some sensitive material. You can wander around and ask anyone questions, though please remember that the doctors are not here for consultations, so please do not turn any conversations into a doctor's visit. That's enough from me. Please now look around and ask whatever questions you want. If you'd like to register today, then just go to reception and they'll get you organised. I'll be based here in the waiting room, so you can ask me any questions as well, of course. That is the end of section 2. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a man and a woman discussing the man's recent training. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi Kevin, welcome back. Hi Christine, thanks. It's good to be back. Do you have a moment? I want to get some feedback about the training you've been on. Of course, I have a meeting in 20 minutes but I'm free until then. So, you were away for three nights. Was the accommodation okay? Well, the room was clean and it was serviced every day before I got back. It was a little bit noisy as the side of the hotel where I was sleeping was quite near a train line, so every time a train passed I could hear it quite clearly. Trains weren't that common at night though, so it didn't disturb me too much. I see. Well, next time we book that hotel we'll request a room away from that side. Did you find the conference centre where the training was easily? The directions they gave me were atrocious. I ended up being half an hour late on the first day. The directions instructed me to take a road that went the other way. It was only when I stopped at a petrol station and asked for directions that I was able to get back on the right road. Didn't you have a sat-nav? I did, but the charging cable had broken and it wasn't working that morning. If it had been working, then there would have been no trouble at all. Were they okay that you were so late on the first day? Some of the other trainees gave me looks, but the trainer wasn't worried and she was very apologetic about the problems. She even phoned her boss to complain at the first break and told me they would fix things immediately. That's more like it. Yes, and that really summed up the trainer. Nothing was too much trouble for her. She was also extremely knowledgeable about her subject and skilled at getting her ideas across. A natural teacher, I'd say. 
I'm happy about that. At my last training, the trainer was just awful. He was late, he hadn't prepared, and he plainly didn't care about any of the trainees. Oh, that does sound awful. Was everything okay at the conference centre? Well, the internet connection was a bit slow, which was annoying, as I wanted to keep in contact with the office. It didn't really affect the software training, though, as we didn't need to go online very often. The training room had everything that was needed, though it would have been nice to have drinks there. These places are all air-conditioned, and it can make you very dry. The food was fine, and the place was clean and tidy. How were the other trainees? Well, I got a bit of a frosty reception when I first arrived because of my lateness, but they soon warmed up after they heard the reasons and were fantastic. We all became very friendly. Did you all have the same knowledge level? Yes, pretty much. It was really good in that way, as we all shared the same problems and so we could discuss things and learn from each other. It was actually really productive and the best part of the training. We swapped contact details so that we can keep in touch and help each other with the new software installations. It's often the way that contacts can be just as productive as the training. Yes, exactly. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. So, did you manage to get the software all installed on our systems? Yes, I did, but it was quite a struggle. What happened? The plan was after the training I would spend the weekend here at the offices installing everything. That was a bit tough, having to spend the weekend here. Yes, but when things like this happen, my contract states that I get an extra four days in lieu that I can add to my summer holiday. That made my wife quite happy. No, I bet it did. So, I had a real long session here at the weekend. What happened? The first thing was that our existing operating system was a bit out of date for the new software. In order to fix that, I had to run updates on the whole system, and during that time, I just had to wait. Did it take long? A couple of hours. It had to be done though, or I'd have had to buy new computers for everyone. The updates were slow, but free. The next problem was that our systems just couldn't accept the new software. I tried everything, but it wouldn't work. I thought I'd have to get a consultant in this morning to help me. How did you fix that in the end? Fortunately, one of my fellow trainees on the course had just done what I was trying to do, so I called her. She managed to talk me through everything. It took a bit of time, though, and I really thought I'd have to get the consultants in. So, it all got installed in the end? Yes, but the problems hadn't ended. What happened next? Well, after I got everything fixed up, I did a few trial runs in order to see if things were working well. It seemed fine, but then I noticed some irregularities. Unfortunately, a bug had got into the system and was starting to mess things up. How did you fix that? It was lucky I saw it so early, or I'd never have fixed it. I had a look at the code that was causing the problem, and I recognised it. It was something the antivirus setup we have already couldn't handle, so I had to buy some more complex add-ons. They were downloaded straight away, and they cleared away the bug. Was that the end of it? Almost. The last thing was that I stayed so long at the office on Sunday night that the automatic alarm was set while I was still there. Of course, the alarm went off, and the alarm was blaring out. I thought the police were going to come and take me away. Did you call the security firm and give them the all-clear password? Yes, I did. But it was the old one. I gave the new one straight away afterwards, but it was too late then. I had to call the boss, and he called the security. Luckily, it all happened before the police got there. That is the end of Section 3. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on the Atacama Desert in Chile. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning everyone and welcome to this lecture on geography. We are going to continue our focus on deserts and desertification and today we'll look at the phenomenon of rain shadow deserts. As an example, we'll have a look at the Atacama Desert, the highest and driest desert in the world. The centre of the Atacama Desert is known as the driest place on earth. The reason for the Atacama's aridity is due to its special geographical conditions which create what is known as a rain shadow over the area. Rain shadow deserts are formed because tall mountain ranges prevent moisture-rich clouds from reaching areas on the other side of the range. In the case of the Atacama Desert, winds coming off the Atlantic Ocean carry moisture towards the Andes. The mountains cause the moist air to rise until condensation causes the moisture to be released as rain. As all this moisture is released from the cloud, only dry air moves over the top of the Andes. Any wind that comes off the Pacific towards the Atacama Desert is too cool to retain any moisture. The result is that nearly all the air above the Atacama is too dry to create any rain, and it is this that is known as a rain shadow. One unexpected benefit of the rain shadow over the Atacama and the desert's high altitude is that it creates an unusually clear sky, and so the area is ideal for the observation of space. Last year, the US National Science Foundation inaugurated the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, one of the world's most powerful telescopes. The telescope comprises 66 antennas, that will provide high-resolution images of the earliest galaxies in the distant universe, as well as the formation processes of planets circling stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. Scientists from around the world will have the opportunity to explore such objects as they never could before, with an array of telescopes more than a hundred times more powerful than any previous millimetre arrays. The Atacama Desert of Chile covers the northern third of the country, stretching more than a thousand kilometres. Straddling the southern border of Peru, it is bound on the west by the barren hills on the Pacific coast, and it extends east into the Andes Mountains. At an average elevation of about 4,000 metres, it is not only the highest desert in the world, but also one of the coldest, with temperatures averaging between zero and minus 25 degrees Celsius. The plant and animal life in the Atacama survive under perhaps the Earth's most demanding conditions. Local populations have relied on some of the species of plant for medical purposes for generations. Animal life is very rare in this desert, though there are a few insects and lizards to be found. Mice and foxes are also present, but in very small numbers. In spite of its inhospitable environment, the Atacama Desert has a variety of natural resources and the Atacama was one of Chile's chief sources of wealth until the First World War. Prior to that time, that nation had a monopoly on the nitrate commerce worldwide. Three million tonnes were extracted in some years and the taxes alone on these exports amounted to 50% of the government's revenues. Currently, the Atacama Desert is littered with approximately 170 abandoned nitrate mining towns, almost all of which were shut down decades after the invention of synthetic nitrate in Germany at the turn of the 20th century. 
Since that time, sulphur has been mined, as well as copper, which is the region's chief source of revenue, providing over 30% of the world's copper supply. The Atacama border dispute between Chile and Bolivia began in the 1800s over these resources. Because of the lack of rainfall, the environment offers little support to agriculture, but some farming is done near the river oasis. Lemons are grown on the shores of the salt marshes, while potatoes and alfalfa are grown near the lower river. Despite extremes and desolation, there is stunning beauty, and tourism is now one of the major sources of income for the area. With the Andes as a backdrop, the desert contains five snow-topped volcanoes, which are the highest volcanoes in the world. The desert also has impressive geysers, lagoons and other spectacular natural features. In addition, these beautiful and rare sites draw scientists wishing to study the area and, as a result, environmentalists are concerned about the number of people who enter the Atacama and the environmentalists claim that the visitors have not been educated sufficiently to understand the delicate balance that is needed in this environment. Urbanization and mining operations have already brought about some damage and overgrazing of domestic livestock has occurred in the north as has commercial gathering of rare plants, including cacti and bulbs. It's hard enough for plants to grow in this area as it is, without having their growth cycles broken up by humans. That is the end of section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.